But the reality is if you surround yourself again with uh, the right support team and the right mentors, it, it's just like any other business. It would be just like running a, a large multifamily property as well. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sinzi, our host of the Wilbur Profits Podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbo. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I'm doing good. Got a copy of The Honeybee. It's been out for a couple of weeks now. If you want to get it, go on jakeandgino.com. Click on there. It'll take you to Amazon. Buy a copy. I love it. Just finished the Audible recording, Jake. That was a lot of fun with the deep, rich voice, Jake. Oh, man. Watch out now. Watch out for this guy. <laughs> yeah. Hope I nailed it. How you doing? Hey. I'm doing good. And, and I think when you, when you get there and you buy a copy for yourself, you're probably going to want to buy one for a friend too and, and send it out. So, uh, you know, don't be stingy. Holidays are coming up. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> we have a great guest today. Today's guest is Nicole Stoller. Through her podcast, The Richer Geek, Nicole helps IT professionals find creative ways to build wealth and financial freedom through buy and hold investing. So without further ado, Nicole, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It is great to be on here with you guys. Hey, thanks, thanks for hopping on, and maybe we can get into uh, some, some hotel stuff later on, and you can talk about those fees that Gina was talking about for our live event. But in the meantime, just give us a, the background on how you got started in real estate. Sure. I started like a lot of other people. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad in 1999, so it was just recently published around that time. And it, at that point in time, my husband and I, I was just out of college. He was still going to college. I was actually working a second job in the evenings. We didn't have a lot of money. So I was really trying to get a personal finance education, which is how I came across that book. And I'm very much of an action taker. So I read the book and I said, we have to do this. I love it. I'm very interested in real estate. Let's go. Signed us up for a seminar. We went to this seminar, which was 100% on how do you creatively find real estate when you don't have a lot of money? And that, that was entirely what they taught us. And we learned, we came back, we applied those principles. We bought uh, properties without any money, so to speak. There's actually, you do need some money, but you know, if at a feasible level, seller financing. And, uh, but then there's all these other things we didn't know, like, was it actually a good property? <laughs> Should we really buy that property? How do we man manage residents? Uh, we just failed miserably. So we got the first part right, but that seminar did not teach us really how to have a full re real estate business. So we decided, hey, we're committed to this. It's our fault. We don't really know what we're doing. How do we get an education? And my husband went to go work in multifamily property management for a, a large developer that would have like 400 to 600 unit apartment complexes within the area that we were living at in the time. Wow. So Jake, the three steps, buy right, manage right, and finance right. Right, Jake? In, in addition to that, Gino, you either seek to serve or you pay to play. <laughs> and it sounds like you did a little bit of both there. <laughs> wow. Wow. I love, I, can I just, I love how you said that because I, I wrote an article about the fact that you, you're going to have to learn some way. You either, you know, you go work in the business, which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. You pay someone who has gone before you, who's made mistakes to help you avoid those mistakes. Um, or, or you're going to just do it on your own and you're going to make a lot of mistakes and it's going to cost you a lot of money. So you're going to learn or pay one of those ways. So which way would you uh, tell our listeners to do it? Well, in today's world, there's enough people that have gone before you. And if you want to be successful right out of the gate, th that's what you should do. You should team up, partner, learn from those folks. Uh, just d don't try to reinvent the wheel yourself. Don't try to do it on your own. And a lot of I would say a lot of what people might focus on is like one or two aspects like we did. Well, we don't have a lot of money. How can we creatively buy properties? But that was a disaster because there's a lot of other components that <laughs> obviously need to be factored in. Mm -hmm. So how, why did you guys choose multifamily as your niche to get into real estate? Yeah. So I think part of it, well, so one of the things 
that I, if I can uh, just emphasize, it's important to find a right mentor, work with the right team. And also it is really important to build a strong network of people. And that has helped us over and over and over again. So at the time where we were living, we had met a, a gentleman who worked for this property management company. He was in one of our uh, classes. You know, it was more like the local RIA type of thing. And after this failure, we said, you know what? Let's call him up and see if he has a job. So that was it. It was, we had met him, we liked him. He was in kind of a regional manager type of position. And he offered my husband a job starting at one of the multifamily complexes and then growing from there. Mm -hmm. So we chose it because we knew someone, I, I, you know, if we'd known someone maybe that was in construction, right. And doing new builds, maybe that's what we would have learned, but it was more, Hey, this is someone we met that we liked that we connected with. And that was really what started down that path. So Nicole, how has it been uh, in real estate, trying to balance a career, a family, real estate, where have the challenges been for you? Yeah, so it, it's a great point. Um, I think I, I'm pretty good about time management and I get up super early and uh, block out my time to do certain things. My husband really handles day-to-day -day operations of the business. And mm -hmm. then what I do is all of the back end, the things that I can do at three in the morning, right? The things that I can do to help support him, whether it's, you know, marketing when we have, um, you know, when we're, we're looking to find a new residence president, uh, making sure that we are connecting, following up with people, emails, those kinds of things. So I do the um, non-business hour type of things and he does you know, more of that day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. So what does day-to-day -day operations look like for you guys? What are you managing right now? Yeah, as we transitioned into the hotel business, what we put into place was, first of all, we hire a general manager at the hotel who's handling more of that day to day. And then we also, and this is, you know, completely optional depending on the skill set of your general manager and how you really want to run your business. But we also have a property management layer in there mm -hmm. that's more about like in the hotel space, you know, if, if uh, you've got to have 24 by seven operations. So let's say, uh, the night shift person suddenly calls in sick. What are you going to do? So this property management company has staff that can fill in if that type of thing happens. So that's a little bit unique to this particular space. Now, when we had pure multifamily, we self-managed a hundred percent those properties. Mm -hmm. How did you transition into the hotel space? Well, this is an interesting story. There's kind of two things. One is that we'd already, through networking, we had already met a gentleman that has been in the hotel field for 20 plus years. That's all he has done. And we were very intrigued by the numbers and we were considering investing with him in a new build, like complete new construction. He was looking for land. He knew our broker and that's how we got connected. Um, but we didn't actually move forward with that at the time. It was more kind of kicking the tires, looking at numbers and we liked what we saw, but didn't, didn't really pull the trigger. We received an unsolicited offer for our 50 unit apartment complex three times. And this was in 2016 and we invest locally. We stay within the Phoenix Metro market. And at that point in time, we could not find a similar type of property that we wanted to leverage our 1031 exchange into that met our criteria. I mean, I would say cap rates then were about 6%, maybe a little bit more, but not, not much. Uh, and now they've pushed even lower. So we weren't, we were kind of looking at it saying, this isn't, this isn't really worth um, the return on our investment. Mm -hmm. So we contacted the hotel guy and we said, hey, uh, we're going to be under 1031. Do you know of any good hotel deals that we can take a look at? And so that really started the process. He, he's really well connected, knew about an off-market property. And that is how we transitioned into hotels. Really, again, help of a mentor in that space. Mm -hmm. What do you Both like? Leg. I want to know which brand. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, that's a, um, it is part of the choice hotels brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the, what do you like about hotels more than multifamily? Yeah. So it, first of all, we like the returns right now uh, and, and that's just simply 
a function of our particular market. Phoenix is a very hot market, even, even now for multifamily. And there are a lot of big institutional funds that have mm -hmm. come in and they're okay with four, four percent cap rates, right? So that the first thing is that, you know, our, our hotels are at least a 10 cap or potentially more depending on how uh, overall performance is. Mm -hmm. uh, the other piece of it is that we like, I want to say it's almost like there's less competition. Um, hotels tend to be if you're not if you're not talking about a big corporation, right? Because certainly there's big corporations, large private equity firms that own some of the very massive, like a JW Marriott or something like that. But if you're talking about this space that we're in, which is uh, limited service, focused on a kind of different market, it's very much of a family business where people mm -hmm. have been in the business and then their their cousins are in the business and they and they grow this way and it can be hard to break into because if you didn't grow up in that it, it it's a it's a little bit of a jump for people and it's they're they're not necessarily comfortable making that jump but the reality is if you surround yourself again with uh, the right support team and the right mentors, it, it's just like any other business. It would be just like running a, a large multifamily property as well. So there's a lot of mom and pops in this industry, huh? Yep. And it's yeah. a fragmented industry also, correct? Yes. So what makes a good deal in hotels? What are you looking for? What are the value adds in, in hotels? Yeah. So uh, what you're looking for, hotels are interesting because you can get a lot of market information. There's reports that come out that basically compare the, the hotel that you're looking at to other like hotels in similar segments. And there's uh, different segments, just like you have in multifamily, you know, your A, B, C, and down from there. Uh, in this, you know, you're looking at limited service, select, extended stay, et cetera. So you kind of move up from there. Um, but you're looking at if you're looking for value add, which is what we always look for, is where it's not quite performing, but it has the opportunity to do so. So that would be the revenue per available room, which is a rev par, and that's an, a, a term used in the hotel industry, where it's lower than other performing ho other hotels within mm -hmm. the same market, within the same type. Um, you're looking at the average daily rate. Is the average daily rate, again, lower than those other hotels? And then you're, you're factoring in, okay, location, just like you would do with multifamily. Where is this hotel, you know, close to economic drivers, employment or travel or events that people are coming into town for. So you're looking at those pieces and you're saying, okay, what is wrong with this hotel? <laughs> What's mm -hmm. going on here? And you're looking at things like maybe it just hasn't been updated and it looks not very pleasant. And so the pictures online and when people are deciding where they're going to stay, they look at it and they go, eh, I don't, I don't want to stay there. Reviews could have bad reviews and the people are complaining about the service or the cleanliness of the rooms, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's several elements that come in when you look at it and you say, okay, it look, needs to look nice. We need to make sure that our staff is engaged and that we're creating that right experience for the guest. Uh, and some of those things will really take care of themselves. Uh, I would say the third thing, though, is we, do, we don't buy a hotel because of a flag, but we would not buy a hotel because of a flag. So it is really important to be associated with a brand that has, you know, loyalty programs, that's offering amenities that people prefer. Mm -hmm. So what type of markets uh, serve hotels well? I'm in St. Augustine here in Florida and they're building them like crazy. Renaissance is putting one up. There's not enough because the demand is amazing here. They just put up an embassy suites that Jake drove by. It took three years to get it passed. It's on the ocean. It hit 90% occupancy within the first three months of being open. It's amazing the demand. Um, here we have the Night of Lights. So it's a great uh, Christmas time of the year. It's the number two wedding destination in the country, St. Augustine. There's the beaches here. So there's so many different things that this market allows for hotels. What are you looking for in a market if you're going to be about purchasing a hotel? Yeah. So one of the biggest things is economic drivers. What's And where is the hotel located mm -hmm. and who are they trying to serve? So uh, one hotel that we, the, the hotel that we currently have, we have another one that's closing uh, later this month. Well, 
November, I think we're already, in, but closing in November. But the first hotel is more like transient. People are traveling uh, down a major freeway between Texas, California, and going through Arizona. Mm -hmm. And so generally that is not booking large groups, although it's interesting there is a skydiving um, a, a big skydiving place close by. And we do have the German skydiving team comes in and books the entire hotel for a couple of months. So we do have those big groups, but in general, it's not businesses. It's not that type of thing. The other hotel that we are buying, absolutely. It's very close to uh, employment centers where those companies will have, you know, they're going to bring in 30 employees for a training. They want a hotel that has free breakfast, free Wi-Fi mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, is very close. So people don't have to drive far. They can take an Uber or, you know, it's, it's just not that far. And there's restaurants close by that they can walk to and, and be able to have, um, few, you know, food for the evenings, that type of thing. So you're looking for the attraction for the type of hotel. So, you know, uh, Gina, what you were describing, it's, you know, an, a nicer type of hotel. It's maybe it, people are even booking the weddings there, mm -hmm. or even if it's on the beach, they're booking the weddings and they want to have large family, large groups come in. And then there's a free breakfast and there's those kinds of amenities, which I could see absolutely would drive up the demand. Mm -hmm. So um, for your type of deals, how do you, what, what are the number of rooms that you're looking for and what amenities are really attractive in a hotel do you think? Yeah. So uh, the number of rooms, uh, you know, I, I think that that just varies. Uh, the one that we currently have is 81 rooms and, and in the hotel industry, they'll say keys. So it's mm -hmm. 81 keys. Mm -hmm. And the other one that we're purchasing is 64. So it's smaller, but it's uh, a higher revenue per available room just mm -hmm. because of location and being closer to uh, employer base. And so I would say, you know, we're not looking for uh, someone I was talking to said motels. We're not in motels. So motels would be like your roadside, you know, your 20 room mm -hmm. uh, hotel with those exterior doors. We're not in that space. So hang on, hang on, hang on. You said you're looking for cash flow, and I have a feeling, <laughs> I have a sneaky suspicion that you can get a nice cap rate with a motel. I may be wrong, <laughs> but yeah, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. You well, so you're right. The broker that we're working with said there's there's a motel <laughs> in Gila Bend that's on the way between you know Phoenix and Mexico that is like the most profitable. But you know, yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, management play. It's tough. <laughs> Nicole, yeah. as far as these expenses, it, is it similar to what a um, uh, I guess a multifamily is because you have payroll, you have contract services, you repair property taxes, insurance. Is it very similar? Uh, you have that, but you also have more supplies, right? Uh, you have cleaning more employment expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you're cleaning every single day. So it's, it's almost like an interesting little comparison between a, let's take a single family home, long-term rental versus a short-term rental that you put on Airbnb or VRBO The the short-term rental is always going to be more profitable, mm -hmm. but it also has more expenses and more turn and more activity, very similar to that. Do you um, get deal flow specifically from brokers or how do, how, how do you get deal flow in, the, in this niche? Yeah, brokers and also people in the niche. And it is a close knit community. People are, they always have their ear to the ground. They'll know of people that are looking to sell, looking to trade up. Same thing with like in the multifamily space, you know, buy a 50 unit, trade it up to a hundred unit, trade on from there with 1031 exchange. Very, very similar. Uh, and then brokers that specialize only in hotels. Like that's mm -hmm. all they do. So what risks do you see in this industry? Do you see maybe the recession hurting this industry as far as people not being able to book um, people's preferences where they don't want to stay in hotels? They like Airbnbs. What risks do you see in your, in your industry? Yeah, I think all of those are risks. So the first thing is uh, economic downturn, which would impact anything, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about the short-term rentals, it would also impact uh, the hotel business as well, because people you know, wouldn't be traveling as much and businesses would cut back on travel and those types of things. So uh, one of the things that we learned because of our failure in the very, very beginning is to be very conservative in our underwriting and especially in today's market, right? Because all assets are much higher than they would have been, you know, even two years ago. So 
what we did is we basically, you can also get all of this data. You can see what was the average occupancy for met hotels in the Metro Phoenix in the same subset during the past 10 years. And I will say that 2010 was one of the worst years in the mm -hmm. hotel industry. Uh, and just in, that's really a good year to look at and say, okay, what was the worst then? And what was that actual occupancy in Phoenix? And then can we still make money? Now we're not going to be loving life. Mm -hmm. It might not be a ton of money, but can we still be able to generate revenue if we're at that occupancy again? And uh, that's how we underwrite based on that. And it's really great right now, but we want to look at what, what could be feasible. A couple of things that it looks like is very similar to multifamily. First is syndication. Uh, this asset definitely lends itself to syndication, correct? Yes. And that's the process that we're in right now with this particular hotel. And uh, that has, there has been a lot of moving pieces with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a, a very interesting learning experience. So how do you offer that opportunity? Because with multifamily, Jake and I, it's the three, three basic needs, Jake. What are they? It's food, clothing, and... Actually, we should ask Nicole. It's food, clothing, and what, Nicole? Food, clothing, and shelter. No, we, we, we like to say food, clothing, and apartments in, in our <laughs> land because that's where we think it's going. But anyways... <laughs> So for us, when we pitch multifamily, that's what we pitch it on. And we also, you know, offer the opportunity by saying, listen, we're becoming a renter nation. You know, when the recession comes, people are not going to be buying homes. They're going to be renting homes. And millennials love the, love the fact that they can pick up and move out away and, and all that. How do you go about the process of trying to offer the opportunity of a hotel uh, asset to a potential investor? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. So first of all, this particular hotel, the location is really key. There's um, a major highway that's coming in. There's a tremendous amount of economic development. So the location itself mm -hmm. lends even where the land is going to end up, right? And not that we buy for appreciation, but, but we, we have a really good sense. And this is why we stay local to our market because we understand the dynamics and those pieces that are going on. Mm -hmm. The other thing is looking at the opportunity to grow revenue with this particular hotel through contracts. And some examples would be, so we talked about corporate, but the other piece would be you, if you see these kids sports teams that travel, the, um, the soccer teams, the baseball teams, there are booking agencies that just all they do is handle the travel for all these teams. Mm -hmm. And there's a recreational area close by this hotel. And again, that part comes to location where they're playing these sports, right? And so booking large groups as a result of that, by the time you do that, and, and you can factor out and forecast based on that. I think everyone could just see the potential for this hotel. One, that you know, even if we have economic downturns and changes, and then also the location is, is really pretty key. Mm -hmm. I like that. The other question that I wanted to ask about was cost segregation. The cost segregation must lend very well to this asset too, correct? It does, yes. So that's why I'm like, we have to hurry up <laughs> we have to hurry up and get that done in 2019. So let's close. Uh -huh. Chop, chop. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Um, I wanted to ask you about the podcast. What gave you the idea to start the podcast and what is your podcast all about? Yeah, so that is a great question. This, you, you guys will appreciate this because if you talk with anyone, and I don't know to the level, let's say you're talking with someone who's not a real estate investor and they say, well, what do you do? And you say, well, you know, we're real estate investors. And you might just stop there. So the general public doesn't know that there's about 50 different niches in real estate investing. Mm -hmm. But what would happen is uh, people that I work with know that I invest in real estate and they would say, hey, can we grab coffee? I'd love to understand and I'd love to pick your brain. And I'm open to doing that. And I'd sit down with them and they'd say, so should I do fix and flips? And I'd say, I, I don't. I don't know. I've never done them. I can't, I can't tell you anything about that, but I know people who have. So what gave me the idea was I know people in my network, which mostly is people in tech that are doing different things around real estate investing. And it's not something that people commonly talk about, right? You're sitting in a cube next to someone else. It's not like you're going to say, 
hey, do you invest in real estate, right? It doesn't necessarily come up. And I wanted to get those stories out and I wanted to share a little bit of the creative things people are doing, plus also my own experiences. I love that. I think, um, I think it's very interesting too, because the, the money is essentially worthless. Holding paper dollars is not a good idea. So whatever you're doing, if you're making a lot of money in tech, you need to own assets. So as inflation goes and the dollar gets devalued over the years, you need to own something that's going to actually appreciate and print the dollars that are becoming more worthless. So I think the key is to get assets. You know, you, you alluded to Rich Dad before, but I think that's so important. So like for anyone out there that's in tech or you know, has a high paying job, put it into something that's going to be an asset and make more money. And, and that's not, you know, going to be a house. Uh, you know, I think all, you know, we're, we're in, you know, homes and things right now, but that, that is not something that I, you know, I own a house. It's great, but that's a luxury uh, in, in my mind. So I think you really want to look at something that, you know, if it's real estate or whatever, that's going to be able to produce future uh, cash flows for you. I yeah. Like so, so yeah, you took it, you absolutely, I had the start and you're absolutely correct, Jake. Uh, the other pieces, you know, a W, you know, your W-2 income, you invest in your 401k and maybe you have an IRA outside of that. It's not going to be enough. You can't put enough in there. You just, you absolutely can't. Not if you're talking about a, a certain kind of lifestyle that if you're in tech, you're making a, a great income, your, your 401k won't be enough. So what else can you be doing? Um, that's why syndication is an important tool for people in tech. If they can't do it themselves, they have an expert going out there doing all the work and they can be almost truly passive at the same time, making an 8% for a return or whatever the return is. And then an IRR. And like Jake said, they actually own a piece of an asset. So I think that's, that's really important. Before we get to the short answer questions, I, I just really wanted you to expand on give people a tip or an idea of how, how to get into real estate. Like you got into it. I love the way you got into it. How, you know, how, if someone's listening on to this and they want to get into real estate, whether it's hotels or multifamily or single family, what's, what's, what would you, what advice would you give them? I, the first thing I would say is go to a few meetups and talk with people. Don't make any judgments about anything and ask them what they're doing and what they like about it. You'll get a sense, like what are the bad things? What are the good things? And does that particular niche, whatever it is, appeal to you uh, and why? And then from there, ask that person or go find a mentor or find a program, learn that business and go from there. I like how you said it. It's a business, whether you're in multifamily and everyone understands this, it's people, systems and culture. Those are the three things in any niche. In the hotel, it, it just rings of those three. If you don't have the people and the systems in there, you're going to be a mom and pop working there 24 seven. And it's just like multifamily. So the first mind shift that everyone needs to have is an asset like multifamily or real estate or hotels is a business. Learn how to run a business and learn how to analyze that business and then you'll become successful doing it. Absolutely. Treat it, treat it as the business and don't hold dollars, put it into assets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. All right, we are back. What is your best habit for success? Finding, finding and surrounding yourself with the right people that are going to bring you up, educate, train you, train you, help you think differently than you do today. How do you do that? Well, uh, I think meetups are huge. I think also, you know, listening to podcasts. So this is one, another thing I've done. I'll listen to podcasts. I'll hear someone. I like what they said and I'll go find them and I'll send them a note. Hey, what you said really resonated with me. And if I have a question, I'll ask that question at that point, or maybe look for a way to add more value. But, uh, that's one of the pieces and, uh, you know, local networking for sure. 
go get them. Don't wait for them to come to you. Jake, right. what, we, what we did is we started, a, like, like Nicole, you start a podcast and you start podcasting other people and you surround yourself with other people an hour or two a week. You can also start masterminds that way, create masterminds. So there's, there's definitely a lot of ways that you need to surround yourself with like-minded people. So here's a great question for you. You are in the hotel space, which is very much a business, you know, many systems in, that, you know, you have to in, instill and, and make work. What is your best tip for scaling? Because that's a whole nother level. I mean, we, we're, we consider ourselves even as multifamily operators that we're in hospitality, but you, you're really in it, you know, with the, with the overnight stuff and the breakfast and everything. So what's your best tip for scaling? Good people. That's, that's a huge uh, tip for that. So that general manager that I mentioned is really, really key. And helping that person understand the culture that you're, that you're going for, what you're trying to create, what you want guests to feel when they walk in the door, and a little bit of brainstorming around that and making sure that they feel part of that culture. And then they're going to, you know, uh, that'll, that'll flow to the other employees that are working more day to day. So if you don't have good general management on site like that, and I imagine this would be similar to multifamily, it, then it starts breaking from there. You can't scale. You can't get to the next hotel because you've got all these disasters and problems with this hotel. Uh, so that's, that's really key, uh, finding that, that right person. It's amazing. Gino just said people, systems, and culture, and you went two for three. You had, you had the people and the culture on that one. So you guys are very much aligned. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, what was your biggest mistake when starting out, specifically in the hotel space? Oh, biggest mistake in the hotel space. Uh, so we didn't know the industry <laughs> and, uh, and we've worked really hard to educate ourselves and, and obviously participate in that. And we had our mentor that was involved in that. Um, I think our biggest mistake was not really realizing the cyclical nature uh, and this does not exist in every location. So, uh, for example, in Florida, hotels are year round, right? There's, there's a, people traveling there year round. But in Arizona, people do not travel here in the summer. So those are really, really tough months for us. Mm. So I think you've got to get, you, one, just not realizing that. And those were months that there, there was no income. Like, yes, there, that's not when you have the Jamaican bobsled team running exactly. out for two months. That's not it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And there, there were, there was revenue, but we had to put it in, in reserves and mm. we weren't taking income during those months. So it was, it, I don't think it was a mistake, but it was more like an aha, like, Oh, this is a little bit different than multi. <laughs> it's not a consistent. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So you mentioned rich dad, Gino mentioned the honeybee, uh, paired very nicely together, like wine and cheese, by the way, let me, let me say that. Do you have a, a book recommendation that you'd, you'd like to offer besides the ones that have been already mentioned? Uh, so I ha I do like never split the difference by Chris Voss. And another book that I recommend is your best year ever by Michael Hyatt. Oh, okay. well, I haven't read that one. No, no, Chris Voss. Well, though, that one's great. All righty. Uh, and you have a, a deal closing. So anything else in the hopper that you want to share, discuss any projects going on besides that? That's the biggest one. Uh, I've got my podcast and I'm always, and, and one thing on the podcast is it's not just real estate that we talk about, which is pretty cool for me to learn about these other businesses that uh, tech people can, can be doing or are doing or investing in. Got to get that cost seg in, right? Yes. Get that, get that pinned down before the end of the year. Exactly. Uh, so um, best way for folks to get a hold of you, I'm guessing podcasts and what, what's the website? The website is the richer geek, R I C H E R geek.com. And is that you or your husband? <laughs> it's for, it's for the audience. It's for, okay. Hey, how do we all these folks that we all work in tech? How do we become richer geeks? Yeah. Sounds good. You get, you get your real estate professional going and you, you get some cost seg mixed in there. That's, I think exactly. that's how it goes. G dad, what else you got? I like the niche Jake. Um, there's definitely 
so many similarities to multifamily, right? And it's just mm -hmm. another business. And I think what Nicole said is really important. Before you get into it, there's some similarities, but there's some real big differences there. If you don't know the, the you know, like the revenue per available room is really cool. The average daily rate is really cool. If you don't know those metrics when you're getting into it and you just think, hey, this is a great deal. I, I love this property. I the love seasonality. The pool. Right. Yes. The seasonality and, and just, I guess the marketing might be a little bit different and just the, there's just like multiple streams of, of income, Jake. It's like the multifaceted where you can get in and you start picking off different streams of revenue and the scalability. There's very, it's very similar to, um, to multifamily. I think that's the exciting thing. I think cost segregation is also another, another exciting aspect to it. The syndication is another exciting aspect where you can raise capital for these deals Never really thought about it, but I just see them popping up all over here and I get afraid with Airbnb, but still, if you can offer a quality place, I still think there's a real long-term uh, need and benefit oh. for these. Oh, I have, I have something for you too. And this has been a personal observation of mine. So my, my wife loves it when we go to a hotel and there's a full bar downstairs, right? If the full bar isn't there, she loves it when you get the little wines so she can pick one up or two. So if we've been traveling all day and, you know, she doesn't have a roadie with her, she's able to pick up the singles. So I'm just saying it might be something that you want to look at. Is you know? it just your yeah, wife or is it you too, maybe? Yeah. And listen, if, you know, if you have Coors Light, I'll take it. But, you know, I'm not so much into the wine. So You're the wine and cheese guy. You've talked about wine and cheese before. so <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge today and, uh, you know, good luck with your closing next month. Thanks, Thanks Nicole. So much. Take Great care. talking with you guys. Hey gang, Jake and Gino here. Thanks for listening to today's episode. And thank you for being a part of our community and by allowing us to fulfill our core purpose of improving the lives of others by creating communities that allow people to become the best version of themselves. Okay.